Welcome to Mind, Muscle, and Metabolism, the Jade Tita Podcast. Here you get the in-depth science and practical tools needed to change your body, optimize your health, and elevate your mindset. I'm Dr. Jade Tita, and here is what I want you to know. You are different. You are as unique on the inside chemically as you are on the outside physically. And those differences matter. They matter because there is only one rule to achieving optimal health, fitness, and body change. That rule, do what works for you. My goal is to help you understand exactly how. I'm so excited you're here. Your transformation starts right now. Okay, everybody, welcome to today's podcast. Before we get into things, I want to do an introduction to who we're going to be talking about, or I'm sorry, with today. I'm going to be talking to my boy, Sam Miller. And I say my boy because he's become a little bit of a brother of mine in terms of colleague and someone I've been learning a great deal from. And we're going to be potentially doing some things together in the near future. But I wanted to bring him on for one very specific reason. And Those uh, people who know me well know that both my strength and my weakness is that I do not pay much attention, if any attention at all, to what's going on in the greater world of health and fitness. I kind of am in my own silo and don't get too concerned about reading other people's books and other people's work. I'm kind of immersed in my own. And recently I've been exposed to people like Sam who have just, uh, you know, made me see the utility and the benefit of having a wider sort of range of peers and friends that I can pull from in terms of their expertise. And Sam in particular was at a recent event of mine and we got to talking and in my head I was just like, this guy is just a wealth of knowledge. I can learn a ton from him and we kind of hit it off and I really enjoyed his company. And so I wanted to bring him on and I'm hoping that he and I can do more things in the future. But I wanted to introduce you to him. We do a lot of the same stuff, but um, come at it from a slightly different point of view. And I think that when we're trying to figure out what works for us, work as metabolic detectives, so to speak, that is important to get a diverse range of sort of perspectives and influence, and Sam is going to bring that today. Let me just tell you a little bit about him. He's one of these guys who just has a vast array of experience. He's done a ton of different certifications. He also has his bachelor's degree in science from Elon University. He has a master's degree and has like 10 different certs, including functional diagnostic nutrition, NCI nutrition. He's uh, done hormone specialist certs. He actually has done the metabolic effect certs and a ton more. And this guy has a wealth of experience. And he's an educator himself, um, certifying instructors in his methods. Just a super sharp cat. And I wanted you to get a taste of sort of his knowledge. So I wanted to bring him on. And you can expect uh, more individuals like this uh, from me moving forward. Of course, I'll still do the monologue podcast that I know a lot of you love. But I also want to be doing uh, more of these discussion format types of things. So without further ado, let's get into it with Sam. All right, guys. So uh, welcome to the show today. I'm here with my boy, Sam Miller. And I just want to kind of um, you know, give you guys a sort of precursor into why I asked Sam to come on. Um, what was it? A couple months ago, right, man? We, you were down in L.A. We met for the first time in person. Yeah, was it February at the... Uh metabolic mastery seminar yeah 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 so uh, sam came to a seminar i was putting on and we just got to talking and i was just like um yeah this dude is like knows all kinds of amazing stuff and i'm at this place in my career where it's like um i want to just be learning from people and he's just got this fresh take on a lot of things and has a lot of knowledge i don't have and i'm excited to learn from him and uh, we have a mutual friend um cody from boom boom performance podcast and the three of us have kind of been powwowing. I've been learning a ton from both of them. So, Sam, thanks for being here, man. It was kind of last minute. We just talked about this a couple of days ago about getting you on here. But uh, people sort of acquainted you and how you got into this work. And then I want to get your take on specifically the hormone calorie sort of debate. But tell us about how you got into the work you're doing. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it was a combination of both personal personal journey and experience, kind of like yourself, along with what I noticed clients were experiencing. I mean, I I started down the personal training rabbit hole when I was about 18 years old. Uh, started to learn about you know sets, reps, exercise, periodization, what we're doing in the gym, and just ultimately saw this pattern that there, there's more to it than than calorie sets and reps. And you know, I needed to dive deeper and ultimately educate myself. Uh, partially just because I was pretty confused in my own transformation process, as well as in trying to help clients, whether they were sedentary individuals, athletes, active individuals. Uh, I had a pretty significant uh, traumatic brain injury or concussion when I was younger. So my, I had some uh, enlargement of my pituitary gland that was causing uh, some of my own endocrine changes that just forced me to really understand how things like uh, our, our habits and routines sleep, training, uh, nutrition, and recovery play a really important role in regulating the endocrine system uh, for the natural athlete or just anyone who just wants to lose a few pounds of body fat uh, or live their best life and and feel really good from a quality of life standpoint. And I started to just see these patterns of how things were interconnected and uh, how we needed to essentially cultivate this more advanced understanding and break it down for clients in in a much simpler fashion. So I kind of found myself, uh, you know, I, I would learn this information either in a book or on the internet or maybe from a mentor or I'd go to an event or seminar and very rarely uh, were some of the most scientific, scientifically savvy folks able to articulate it in a way that could be uh, implemented in effective coaching. So sort of just started to take it upon myself to make some of those changes and ultimately uh, started off with both personal training, nutrition coaching. Uh, fitness coaching and corporate wellness, and then sort of over the last couple of years, got a little bit more into speaking and, and educating personal trainers, fitness professionals, uh, nutrition coaches. We've had a few dietitians, nurses, and osteopathic doctors in my program now. Uh, so my main focus is just to make make the, that really complex information uh, as applicable as possible to where people can actually leverage it and use it for whatever their goals are, whether that's hormonal restoration, body composition athletic performance, really whatever the case may be for them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, um, it's interesting that, that, that sort of background of struggling with your own sort of stuff. And by the way, guys, for those of you listening, I got some, I'm babysitting some dogs, you know, so you might hear them in the background. Hopefully it's not too annoying. What I'm going to do is when Sam is talking, I'll just mute myself. Um, I like to make these things informal, but I'll mute myself if it gets too annoying. But I do think one of the most interesting things about, I think, the most effective coaches is they usually at some point have struggled with their own sort of um, issues and had to, one, fix themselves because it sort of gets you out of this thing where it's like, um, I I know for me anyway, I was this sort of ignorant, arrogant guy who's just like, hey, be disciplined like me, lift like me, and you're going to be sort of fine. And then I come to find out I had my own issues which made me then understand other people have issues as well that need to be dealt with on an individual basis. So let me, let me ask you this. So the, the big thing I know that you and I deal with, and I know you're getting a lot of buzz. A lot of people are paying attention to your stuff. It's obvious you're super bright. People are learning a ton from you. Tell, tell us, for those who don't know you, how do you sort of um, manage this distinction, this debate that you and I are always talking about between calories and hormones and how do we how do we sort of manage this because i know a lot of people get this confused like should i be doing keto is that a hormonal effect of keto is that a calorie effect should i be counting calories should i be eating intuitive how do i balance these two things right i mean we could certainly i think talk for probably a whole entire weekend on this topic uh which is you know why it lends itself so well to seminars and and talking about metabolism but the, the underlying reason, I, th- I think we have to take a step back, which is why is someone asking that question? Why are they asking me, do hormones matter? Do calories matter? What should I follow? What type of diet should I be on? Uh, and really, we, we end up in this, I, I, one of the first seminars I ever did for nutrition, one of the most popular ones that I've been brought back to speak on is just the idea of, a nut- of nutrition versus a diet. And I think a lot of times when we think about hormones versus calories, we're kind of in that same we have this, these really divergent viewpoints when we actually need both to be successful. And the truth is, is that the person that's asking you that question or asking me that question usually has a physical goal in mind. Maybe they want to lose 10 pounds of body fat. Maybe they want to squat 500 pounds. Maybe they want a six pack. 
And there's something leading, to, leading them to ask those questions to us to ultimately inform their decisions as it pertains to their nutrition and their diet. Uh, so I ultimately take that physical goal and I try to understand what physiological environment do I need to create in their body to get them there. Uh, I'm, I am a proponent for some folks, uh, you know, really need to track their food, cultivate an awareness of portion control and understand the amounts that they're eating in order to successfully lose weight. There are other folks that have a really great internal compass when it comes to navigating portions and and you, you know, you do a great job of articulating uh, bin, binge or trigger foods uh, versus buffer foods and, and people understanding what leads them to be in a caloric surplus. But we have to understand that metabolism, since it's comprised of several different facets, we have our, our resting metabolic rate, which is made up of things like our, our overall uh, skeletal muscle mass, our, our hormonal system, as far as what's going on metabolically with the thyroid, our free T3. Um, you know, someone with more free T3 as opposed to someone with higher reverse T3 levels, they're going to have, they could be the same height and weight and they may have very, very different metabolisms. So to say that hormones don't matter, I think is uh, not fully understanding the picture. By the same token, if you say that calories don't matter and you don't need to track them, understanding that qual both quantity of food, the amount of food that we're eating and the quality of that food, that's one of the biggest determining factors of things like our, our thyroid function. So knowing where your calories are, you're, you're manipulating your hormones. And by understanding your hormones, especially your hunger hormones, uh, hormones needed for recovery and muscle building, you're, you're also going to have a greater understanding of what you need to do calorically from that standpoint. So they really work in this very symbiotic relationship and people try to detach them and put them in these two, two silos. Um, and I really, you know, I've, I've used this example before, but like the complete nutrition plan is kind of like an orchestra uh, where we have these different instruments going on and there's a song that we hear that's ultimately coming out and, and people try to like pick it individual instruments instead of looking at the entire picture of, of what's going on and, oh, it sounds good because of the violin. Well, if you took away the other three, four, five, six instruments in the conductor, it wouldn't really be working the way that it is. So uh, I'm, I'm a big believer that caloric awareness and portion control awareness is huge. It also, if let's say you had an eating disorder, or you're anorexic and you're not eating enough calories, that's going to influence your hormones. Uh, and then vice versa, if we're not healthy internally from a physiological standpoint, whether that's stemming from excess stress or gut health issue, thyroid issue, low testosterone, we're also impacting our body's ability to utilize calories and ultimately whether we will end up uh, in a net energy surplus or deficit in terms of what we're looking at from that overall metabolic equation. So, and just whether we're gonna to wanna to do things like non-exercise activity, exercise activity, uh, and then eating, obviously we have the thermic effect of food as well. So really we have all these different toggles going on and they really need to be evaluated next to each other instead of you know on the same table, instead of taking them out and, and trying to, to argue or kind of pin them against each other. I think people like polarity because it, it creates attention and it's a great marketing tool, but from an educational standpoint for clients, I think we really need to be helping people understand how both are necessary for long-term health um, and for optimal metabolic function and your, your goals, whether that's, you know, performance, aesthetics, or longevity. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because for me, and tell me what you think about this. I know for me, um, I can be intuitive now, right? You know, but for years and years and years, I would weigh chicken breasts and starches and count grams and this is before like my fitness pal and all that kind of stuff you know because i was coming up in the 90s you know and <laughs> you know we were logging all this stuff and writing all this stuff down and after a hundred two hundred five hundred a thousand uh times of logging this food you just know i mean you can look at a big plate that you get from a buffet and say i've got about 10 ounces of protein on this plate i've got about three cups of vegetables on this plate I got about a cup of starch, which equals about 30 to 40 calories on this, or 30 to 40 grams of carbohydrate on this plate. And I do think most people have to go through that, and then they can be a little bit more uh, intuitive. Right. But, I, but I love what you're saying, because to me, I agree with you. We, we do want to create these dichotomies that don't really exist. The two, quality and quantity, from my way of seeing it, are inseparable. And so hormones whichever direction you come from you're going to have to attend 
to the other. One thing I'll say here is that I do feel like hormones uh, definitely, um, and I want to get your take on this, but I feel like, you know, because there's this whole thing about should we be measuring? Should we be measuring hormones and what hormones should we be measuring? Should women measure estrogen and progesterone? I've never, I've run thousands of those tests. I've never necessarily seen those things being hugely influential to me. I just go, what is your biofeedback? Like what is going on with exercise performance and exercise recovery and strength and sleep and mood and hunger and all these things because your hormones are sort of influencing that. And so stabilize that. And usually, but not always, the calories will take care of themselves. And when the calories don't, then you can adjust them. So that's typically how I handle that. But I don't know if you, if, if how you see that or have anything to say on that. I actually love two things that you just said. I, I remember actually before my fitness pal, there was like fitday.com and you could go in and like desktop log your food. Uh, this was, I mean, after manual tracking and like Microsoft Excel and stuff, there was fit day. I, I think uh, a good friend of mine had posted about that on social media the other day, but I totally agree. I, I eat a little more intuitively now, but I know that I don't market intuitive eating because I think it's deceptive to people who have never learned how to effectively track, measure, and monitor their food intake themselves. I have a history of, you know, doing different diet styles. I did weigh and track my food for a long period of time. And even when I don't enter something in my fitness pal, if I'm at home, I don't mind popping it on a food scale or using a measuring cup, or I have the same size plates that I eat off of all the time. I have a very good idea of that. So I love that you brought that up because I think there are folks out there who talk about intuitive eating successfully, but yet they spent a decade doing macros or, or following some sort of portion control based diet. And I feel like that, that is a little deceptive to folks who, who think that their first three months into dieting ever for the first time with no sense of caloric awareness uh, can, can just dive in and not track their food. I love that. Uh, I'm also a big believer in biofeedback. I do weekly I teach coaches to do weekly or biweekly biofeedback. Uh, and then with my own clients, I'm typically doing weekly evaluations of sleep, uh, exercise performance, energy, appetite. Uh, if we're looking at someone with potentially like a, a hormonal issue or testosterone you know, related issue, we might be looking at things like libido, um, overall, uh, you know, things like delayed onset muscle soreness and things like that. But basically looking to see if our stress stimulus and our recovery stimulus or our drains and charges as that kind of uh, use that analogy sort of balance out. So ideally I'm seeing on a check-in form uh, or on a phone call that the amount of recovery stimulus that we've implemented have, have basically allowed someone to feel good. They're progressing in the gym. They're, they're able to successfully progressively overload their body. Uh, we're able to make those changes. They're, they're not having sleep disturbances, hunger and cravings are in check. We have a good regulation of appetite and we begin to structure their food and their lifestyle in a way that works with their, um, their day job or, or, or night shift or whatever it is that they're doing and allows them to have some food freedom there. So a uh, big believer in that. I will occasionally, I, I like having the occasional labs, especially just from like a health perspective, but I do realize for some clients there's budgetary constraints. Not everyone has the leeway with insurance. Not everybody can use a third party lab, depending on the state that they're in. We don't all have access to a functional medicine doctor like yourself. So I don't need labs to help you. However, it's an additional tool in the toolbox to, to have a big, like full picture of the project that we're working on. So if I'm sensing that you're not sleeping well, you're stressed, your appetite regulation is off, we're not making per, uh, improvements in the gym, uh, or I'm noticing something in terms of body composition, it would be nice to see, you know, your, your blood glucose or insulin or A1C along with thyroid function and, you know, testosterone levels in the male, estradiol, things like that. But uh, I think queuing in with your clients and understanding their baselines and, and getting a really good idea of what normal is for them and what they're striving for, I think you can make a lot of improvement. I, I think it's unrealistic to, you could be the most scientific coach or doctor in the world, but I don't know that it's really realistic to, you know, be doing labs every month or, or even, you know, uh, I think the most I've ever done, even on myself is like quarterly, uh, just because you have so many daily variables, uh, so many changes in the body and 
ultimately you need to give the plan time to work. I feel like when we're doing labs all the time, you know, it can take, it can take someone weeks or even months or even years to, to adapt to different stimulus, uh, whether that's from training, nutrition or recovery. And so when we're not really taking care of that, we do sort of, uh, I think we jump the gun on the labs a little bit when we don't allow the program to kind of do its work. Uh, we need we need time and and everyone's system is different. Some people have different levels of stress sensitivity or metabolic changes and adaptations. So uh, there's not like a cookie cutter approach to labs. I feel like it's it's what's available to them. What what does the cost look like? The affordability of that investment to complement their program, especially if they're already investing and paying me a substantial amount for their coaching. I do try to be conscious of well, I'm not going to pull thousands of dollars worth of labs or something like that especially outside insurance in our medical system. Yeah, you know, I did, I did thousands of those things over my career. And I used to do um, monthly with some clients because I had, you know, in my field, functional medicine, especially back in the day, it was, a, it was you know, rich people medicine, basically. So they right. had the income and I was just like, hey, here's what we should do. And I did all those things. And they are, like you said, extremely useful. They can definitely help. I'm not so sure how needed they are for, um, you know, some people just like, oh, we have to get all the labs across the board. I think there's a lot that can be done um, without labs. And actually, that's what I, you know, the, one of the things that I really want to talk to you about, and I think we should just, we'll just start to dovetail into this now is when, so for those of you listening, when Sam, you know, came to my event, he pulls me aside and we're talking. He's like, hey, have you heard of this? I'm like, no, man. He goes on a riff and tell me, like, damn, that's awesome. And he's, I, he's like, have you heard of this? I'm like, no, nah, man, I haven't heard of that. So like, you know, he has a lot to say, especially, and that was in the realm of sort of a male, um, hormonal, you know, sort of uh, approaches. And so I want to just kind of get them to t have your take on this, because I think you have a lot of knowledge in this area. So first, why don't you kind of take us through just the way you see it? They, most of the people listening have heard the way I, I, I look at male, female um, metabolism. And I think um, that we, what we have to do is we have to remember each practitioner brings something very unique to teach us um, with their take on things. So I'm just curious, your take first, let's, let's kind of go through just how you see, is there a difference between the male and the female sort of metabolism? And what, what are those differences? And what should a female maybe be concerned with versus a male? Let's just see what, you know, your sort of take is on that. And then I want to kind of get into the particulars, you know, where you want to go with it. Yeah, certainly. So obviously with the female body being engineered in a sense to, you know, be equipped to carry a baby if necessary or to carry pregnancy to term, uh, I think we definitely have some considerations as far as, you know, there are different folks out there talk about safety theory and, and different concepts in terms of things that influence the metabolism or different stressors on the body. Uh, and obviously with females having a monthly cycle, or at least hopefully in a, in a healthy female having that monthly cycle, there's definitely some differences there. I think, you know, just from a, a sheer caloric equation or metabolic standpoint, we're going to have different resting metabolic rate and, and basal metabolic rate as a result of just your total body mass. And then, you know, we talked about this a lot in, in February is when you put that muscle into motion, you put that body mass into motion, moving a bigger person is caloric calorically costly. Uh, so for men, that non-exercise related activity, that exercise related activity, especially when you have um, a larger frame, you begin to accumulate this additional caloric burn along with the fact that having testosterone enables you to build a bit more skeletal muscle tissue with more muscle tissue. Also with what we're doing in a training session uh, for responses from, you know, things like mTOR and our, our, uh, our glucose receptors and, and the way that we respond from an insulin sensitivity standpoint to exercise, I do believe that having more muscle, uh, being more androgenic does ultimately increase that, that metabolic equation or, or put us in a place where total daily energy expenditure is going to be higher. Uh, and then also in terms of, you know, calorie deficit, muscle retention on the way down, I think is, is different as well. Uh, from a female standpoint, I think we have to be very careful in understanding the relationship between uh, a, a woman's monthly cycle and then female thyroid health. I think oftentimes people look at those kind of separately. I like to pay attention to things like body temperature first thing in the morning, and then also just kind of mapping, mapping out cycles, paying attention to, uh, our nutritional periodization. So not staying in a caloric deficit for excessive periods of time, 
uh, making sure proper reverse dieting happens or, or sort of toggling our approach and making sure that we're balancing, that we're picking the right macronutrients and cal calorie levels for the type of activity that we're picking. So if you're doing CrossFit, we may need more carbohydrate if, versus if you're just walking and doing a lot of uh, low intensity physical activity. So I'd say one of the big uh, changes there is, is testosterone obviously makes a huge difference in terms of uh, what's going on from a muscle building standpoint. And then also as a result, therefore your calories and what your, your daily intake looks like. Uh, but, but females seem to, you know, based on some of the research we've seen from a training perspective can, can kind of handle unique loads and volumes and their, their ability to perform at a lower percentage of their one R one RM or RPE relative to men tends to be a little bit different. And, and now granted, like I work with a lot of people outside of the lab setting and just in day-to-day -day life. So I try to, I try to learn people as individuals, regardless of their gender identity or, or kind of the goal that they're, they're striving for. Um, I don't, I, I've had plenty of differences in women and working with hundreds of clients and plenty of differences in men, even if you, you know, you technically are the same gender, let alone comparing males and females, there's certainly a lot of differences too. So uh, just like a male with uh, suboptimal testosterone levels, the way he has to eat and train relative to someone who uh, has a more optimized or less sensitive endocrine system you know, we're even looking at differences within a gender, let alone between two genders. So I definitely think there's some differences there, but I think you still start with the basics, the, you know, that hierarchy of nutrition, you're still starting with calories, macronutrients, micronutrients, and then uh, supplementation, hydration, things like that, uh, and, and sleep and recovery. But then when we branch out, I think when someone has the basics down, we can start to tailor things for a specific gender. But I do see a lot of folks on the internet trying to make gender specific programs, but their, their, their audience hasn't mastered foundational habits that are needed to ultimately be successful regardless of your gender. So I try to not overwhelm people with, well, I'm a girl, so I have to do this. This is the only program I can do to be successful. I think that is a very limiting mindset. And I think it's more about your psychology as an individual and, and me getting to know you and figuring out like what you can adhere to and I, I mean, we've talked about this a number of times this year, but being, being stressed about what you're eating, being stressed about the type of activity you're doing, just being stressed in your lifestyle and daily life, it's probably more detrimental um, than, than sometimes even the, the food itself and, you know, the way that we think about things and think about our program. That's why the placebo effect can be real, uh, whether it's with pharmaceuticals or different programs. You have to understand that the mind can uh, kind of convince us of a lot of things and, and impact our results. So we need to be aligned with, with, uh, with our programming, whether you're male or female. Um, and so I try to, I try to definitely consider that, but I'd say top, top two or three differences, definitely hormonal, uh, definitely just from a mass standpoint, just with men generally being, uh, different body size. And, uh, then there, there are some differences in like training and recovery as well. And pre well, pregnancy is obviously a huge one too. Yeah, you know, um, I, uh, it's, it's interesting because I, I think you and I are so in alignment on this. It's like you can get lost in the potential nuance. I mean, we are all humans and we share the vast majority of our metabolism, male to female. And so women can definitely train like men and men can definitely train like women and they're both going to get results. And then we can begin to branch out maybe and make some gross generalizations, which if you're listening to what Sam's saying, he's essentially pointing out that's always dangerous to make these gross generalizations. And I agree with him, but we can make some and they can be useful for some people. And then we just get more and more granular based on the person. So we may actually have a female who's training a lot more like what the standard male might be training, like based on her individual makeup, hormonal, personal preferences, et cetera. And a guy actually who needs to be training a little bit more like, you know, a female that standard might be training. I think, though, um, and I, I, I'd like to get your take on this. I think in general, um, what you're kind of hinting at is this idea that we do know that if you take like the two extremes, right, like if you're doing pink dumbbell aerobic classes, right. that is probably not going to be very beneficial for most people from a body composition standpoint. It's healthy. It's fun. It definitely certainly does things for your mood, but probably the weight stimulus is not enough. Um, and I think that's why sometimes maybe we get into this thing about, 
looking at female specific training. Um, it's really like saying, well, it's a personal preference and it's a cultural thing too, right? It's not the cool thing to do. Now we see many women, especially in the CrossFit community, doing that and developing amazing physiques um, that are on a par with, you know, what the men have been building with their weights. And then, of course, we see it on the other side of things where there's men just doing nothing but heavy power lifting and looking like, you know, big, strong beach balls, and they could potentially, you know, sort of move to the middle as well. So I do think there's this, this idea of moving everyone to the center of doing sort of, you know, what uh, my friend Jen Sinclair, she calls it lifting weights faster. You're basically lifting mostly weights for your, your exercise component, right. but you're doing it uh, with shorter rest periods. Yeah. And that gives you this cardiovascular response. So moving everyone into here and then granulating it based on female versus male, I think is really interesting. I love what you said too about the size of a man versus a woman. That's going to make a big difference. So let's get into the male thing just a little bit. So with men, how would you begin to sort of help them understand the hormonal metabolism and what are their unique challenges, especially when you start getting guys my age, 40, 45, who are potentially starting to lose some testosterone? Yeah, I think the biggest thing in our society, I mean, even in 30, 30 year old men, um, you know, our testosterone levels are a fraction of what our grandfathers or great grandfathers were for the most part, as far as the national average, what we're looking at in the reference ranges, obviously our reference ranges are based off the majority of the population. A huge subset of the American population is unhealthy. We are exposed to more technology and blue light stimulus than ever. We spend less time in the sunlight we are sleeping less. Uh, we, we actually, I think, are at a record level of gym memberships across the country, yet we're unhealthier than, than ever before. Uh, I think for the, the last couple of years, for the first time in probably a century, the life expectancy actually like kind of stalled out or has gone down as opposed to increasing, uh, which is very, very interesting. So I see some problems from a recovery and nutrition perspective. I think you know, we've have a, we have a lot of CrossFit, Orange Theory, and, and these higher intensity exercise modalities popping up. We have plenty of, you know, gyms, uh, just like your average corporate gym that you can go get a monthly membership. But, you know, I think the biggest thing I'm seeing with men is balancing those recovery demands, uh, optimizing testosterone, and understanding that by, by getting your physiology in the right place, you can make your life easier in terms of your ability to get physical changes, whether you're, you're trying to have muscular arms, uh, or, you know, wide shoulders or, or, or lean abs or something like that. It really does come down to, you know, if we can, if we can get your testosterone in the right place, because all of these things begin to integrate, right? So when, when a man is, is stressed out, let's say we start to see some changes in circadian rhythm, we start to see some changes in morning cortisol, uh, which is, you know, or an even evening cortisol as far as stress hormone, we're impacting sleep. We know that sleep changes can have a substantial, uh, when we, when we lose sleep has a detrimental effect on testosterone levels. It also decreases insulin sensitivity. And so when we do that, okay, we've now changed our ability metabolically to respond to carbohydrates. We've now likely impacted our central nervous system in terms of our ability to perform optimally and create uh, intense output in the gym. We've now lowered testosterone, which is going to impact and impair our ability to build muscle. And then when we go to the gym, because we didn't perform optimally, you know, when we have, uh, when we create uh, a progressive overload stimulus and, and we have these intense training sessions, you're enhancing insulin sensitivity theoretically, uh, but you're also uh, elevating cortisol. So when we begin to have elevations in cortisol uh, without the improvements in insulin sensitivity and testosterone, we now end up in this place where, uh, you know, we can become overly stressed, which down the road through overtraining and, and the Western American diet, we can begin to have gut health issues. This is where you start to see cortisol can influence thyroid hormone output, elevating reverse T3 uh, and the amount of free T3 we have or potentially elevating TSH. We also just know that corticosteroids in general can be those anti-inflammatory, almost prednisone, cortisone-like compounds in the body kind of sending those messages as well. So we begin to we're sort of not as muscly as we want to be. We feel a little more inflamed, maybe a little more bloated because we're, we're being super active. We're sort of under recovering and then we still want to get leaner. So then maybe we're pursuing a calorie deficit to try and ultimately get those results. So we see a lot of like type A overachiever 
males between 25 and 45 kind of like they're, they're, it's kind of chasing multiple rabbits, but just not understanding the stress response and ultimately doing themselves a disservice because they're working very, very, very hard, but they're not necessarily maximizing their results in terms of what they're doing. And then kind of underfeeding, which then exacerbates the issue uh, versus, you know, if we look at that cycle in the other direction, let's say I give you some carbohydrate, I improve your sleep quality, we elevate serotonin levels, you get great night's rest, you kill it in the gym, which improves insulin sensitivity, you feel more alert, so you increase your non-exercise related activity, maybe you go for a walk outside the gym because you just feel more balanced, feel less stressed, your, your sleep was great the night before, uh, maybe that improves both recovery, overall mood, and then you're getting additional sunlight and exposure to daylight, which helps your circadian rhythm. And now all of a sudden we're, we're kind of creating this cycle in the opposite direction. So it's all about, you know, what, what I try to do with guys, especially in that age bracket is how do we create this positive momentum where we're lowering um, negative adaptations to stress. And I'm specifically stimulating adaptations from stressors such as, um, you know, weight training or specific metabolic uh, stimulus in the form of nutrition as opposed to having stressors that are uncoupled from movement. So, you know, a long, long time ago, before we ever had iPhones or checked our emails or, you know, we were on Zoom right now for this podcast, uh, you know, we weren't looking at screens. We wouldn't sit and get stressed out reading an email. We would get stressed out by some sort of environmental uh, clue or environmental happening that would make us want to move. We would walk, we would run, we would do something. Whereas right now you can get really stressed out, have a release of adrenaline, catecholamines and cortisol and ultimately be super sedentary uh, and we're, we're liberating these energy stores and it doesn't make a lot of sense. So the more I can like bring down someone's lifestyle stress and increase the positive training stress and, and the amount of, uh, you know, whether that's weight training or if, if they're trying to prepare for some type of other event performance related, I can begin to push the envelope with those stressors when I'm able to remove the others. And then as a result, I'm going to then begin feeding them uh, using things like carbohydrate to, uh, you know, insulin working as a counter regulatory hormone to cortisol, really having this, um, this positive impact in terms of recovery, because otherwise we end up going backwards through that cycle. And it's like being on a hamster wheel that we can never get off of. You feel worse, you're not getting leaner, you're eating less then you're not sleeping well uh, based on, on what's going on as far as cortisol and uh, melatonin and, and your ability to fall asleep at night. And so I just see a lot of people falling victim to that trap. Um, and it's not to say that the calorie deficits aren't important or that you shouldn't you know, take life seriously or, or, or train hard. It's just the way that people are combining things without any particular plan in their day-to-day -day stressors. I think we need to zoom out sometimes and like create a, a, a bigger picture strategy where we can really periodize the nutrition and training and, and figure out how to get people, um, you know, this probably also lends itself to a conversation of the nervous system and like parasympathetic sympathetic states, but just getting people to zoom out a little bit and understand that they're stressed about their food, they're stressed about eating, they're stressed about training, and then they're not sleeping, and then they stress some more, and then they're stressed about work, and then they're trying to optimize their physique and their body composition, and it just we don't really get great results that way. I, uh, I have a, an anecdote for myself. I think I may have told you this, but it's, it's a real, it goes right to what you're saying about stress. I, um, I spend part of my time at my place in North Carolina. And I know Sam's in Raleigh. I was in Asheville. And then I spend part of the time in Los Angeles. In LA, I tend to get early morning sunshine up on my deck. I tend to have a whole different sort of lifestyle. I walk a lot more. Um, it's funny because in North Carolina, I also snore like a banshee, dude. I'm like a rhinoceros. I mean, it's like really bad. And so whenever anyone listening to this, if you snore like I snore and it's super loud, trust me, you're dealing with sleep apnea and you're dealing with lack of oxygen during the night and your cortisol levels are sky high and you're not going to get good sleep and you're going to be hungry and all of that kind of stuff. So what I had, had learned is that when I'm in LA, I feel fantastic. And what I recognized was I actually in LA typically wear this little mouth guard that juts my jaw a little bit forward to help with sleep apnea. And I did not have one in North Carolina. And for a while, it's interesting, right? Because it goes right to what Sam is saying. I didn't, I know this stuff. I live, eat and breathe this because I'm in my own body though. I forget essentially what I'm doing. So part of me is like, I feel so good in Los Angeles. What are the elements? 
The biggest one, actually, believe it or not, was this little mouth guard, this little change that I made in the ability to you know, calm my sleep apnea a little bit, my snoring, which then has this feed forward effect that Sam is talking about that then makes me get up, makes me go for lots of walks. Gym, I immediately start to shed my water layer and start to look much better when I'm in Los Angeles versus when I'm in uh, North Carolina. So it's, it's just a really interesting thing. And most people just want to focus on what am I eating and how am I exercising? This for me was really about sleep and that's about stress management. So I have a great personal example to kind of piggyback on that as well. I mean, I was in a situation, you know, a year or two ago, um, just in terms of we don't think about stress from connections. We don't think about stress from relationships. There's actually one of my new clients is a, a PhD candidate doing research on the stress that we experience and the cortisol release from relationships. It's super fascinating. But ultimately, I'm in a place in 2019 where I've all of the things that I used to think would be so detrimental to my body composition, eating out, traveling, um, having an irregular schedule, changing, you know, time zones, things like that. I I've actually gotten leaner, improved my body composition to maintain my strength, uh, while eating likely more calories, just because of the fact that my, my stress levels in other areas of life are lower. Uh, I'm likely, I would assume, you know, kind of the same thing. I think I had to, I had to do something similar in terms of uh, grinding my teeth and ultimately improve sleep quality but ultimately just stop stressing about a lot of things. And, and I've created a bit more freedom in these areas, not really by choice, but just because occupation and, and what I do for work has required that travel uh, and ultimately came to a place where I'm probably doing equally as well, if not better. Uh, and we just forget about those stress inputs. Uh, and overall, you know, at the end of the day, we have this split column that needs to be balanced and if it's not in balance, you know, that accumulates day after day after day after day. So I'm sure that that's a big difference for you being able to walk sun, you know, getting sunlight and uh, how that ultimately impacts your sleep at night, especially when you didn't have uh, the tool for sleep apnea and everything like that. So I think it's very, very hard to evaluate yourself on paper. And that's probably why, you know, coaching can be so effective, not only for the accountability, but the strategy piece and the mindset piece, because sometimes we get very much in our own heads uh, even with, you know, all the knowledge that we have, sometimes it can backfire. So I certainly agree that stress, stress can be undervalued. I think people just don't think of it in the way that, that we just discussed. I think people see infomercials on cortisol and assume, oh, well, that's why I have belly fat. Well, for a good chunk of the population, they don't move enough and they have never ex tried to have a calorie deficit or they're aware of their, their portions but there is a subset of the population that is very stressed out and it, it's not that it's directly responsible for immediate body fat gain but it's causing changes in sleep and changes in the types of food and, and willpower that they have over their food decisions that then ultimately influence the weight gain that they're experiencing uh, and i think sometimes we we lose sight of the links all the chain links that are there for us um, and basically the trail of these different stressors that get us to where, where we ultimately are. Yeah, and if you guys are listening to what Sam's saying, it's really interesting because it goes to what Sam and I do. One of the things that Sam and I both do is we teach uh, professionals uh, how to coach their clients. And one of the things that uh, he just said, and I will second, is that what we typically do, you take someone who's been sitting on a couch and being a couch potato and not moving, and you start them moving again, and, and eating correctly, that's great, but it will only work for a time because that then can become a stress to the system. And that's where you need all these extra tools that Sam is talking about. Some of these are not complex at all. Um, actually, they, some of them are pretty easy. We can say, you know, manage sleep, go for walks, do this kind of stuff. But then what we want to learn and what Sam and I teach is also how do you know for example, oh, Jade's dealing with sleep apnea. That's his major thing. That's the thing that's making his diet and exercise program not last for him. Here's, uh, you know, Sam might teach you or I might teach you. Here's how to know. Here are the tools to use. For example, I use a Snore Lab. There's other things you can do to track that sleep apnea. Here are the tools that you could potentially use. So if you're listening to this and being like, wow, this all sounds very complicated, 
don't let yourself be overwhelmed by this. Understand that really what Sam is saying and what I'm essentially saying as well is that, yes, diet and exercise. And for most people, you move them to that first. But what happens for most of us is that's the beginning and the end of it, when really it should just be the start. And from there, you have to add all these other components. And then what Sam and I do is we teach, here's how to figure out is this per se who's dealing with estrogen dominance or is this an issue with a man dealing with low testosterone and then why is it because for example um, I know Sam knows this about me too and I think some of you listening do as well but I basically am on TRT now because about four years ago I had a testosterone level of 150 again that was probably because of my sleep apnea and my snoring if we look at sleep people with sleep apnea and heavy snores their testosterone is almost always in the tank. And so we have to sort of understand, yes, the mechanisms, and you can see Sam and I understand these hormonal mechanisms, but then what are the, the inputs, those stress inputs that are, that are uh, keeping us from getting to where we need? And that is where things get varied. So it's like, yes, metabolism, human metabolism, you know, moving people to the middle, getting them eating well and moving, sure but then understanding the difference between male and female potentially, and then understanding all these different things. We are each metabolically unique. We have a unique psychology and we have personal preferences. And what we as coaches do is we go and find, oh, this is the major factor. And a lot of it is so interesting because Sam says it, I say it, you'll hear it all over the place from people. It's really about picking these major stress points and taking that tension off the system so that diet and exercise can work better. So I don't know if you have anything else to add. Yeah, of course. Uh, one system I really like, if you're a coach listening to this, or if you're an individual listening to this, you can use it on yourself, is I, I, I say that if you know how to charge your iPhone every night and you understand that if the battery runs out, um, you will not be able to text and make phone calls and check Instagram, the same concept is true with your body. And we have drains and charges, which you may never understand what a sympathetic stress or, or sympathetic stimulus to the body is as far as the nervous system goes. I don't, I don't expect you to give me a definition of parasympathetic activity, but if you understand the, the difference between your body resting and recovering and, and a charge for your body, rejuvenating your body uh, versus something that is draining to your body, I mean, even training too much or eating too little or even eating too much, depending on your, your current body composition, those things can be drains on the body in the sense that they're influencing our metabolism and overall health. And I think we can break it down into this really, really simple, you know, you basically split a piece of paper in half and, and we could go through and whether it's uh, kids and, and family life, whether it's your job, uh, do, are you enjoying your type of training stressors from the diet, like being in a calorie deficit for someone who's already very lean or maybe, uh, someone who's very sedentary and eating too much, that would be a drain on the body, likely causing like we see pre-diabetic or type 2 diabetes from loss of uh, insulin sensitivity. So breaking it down, like I really like to have these just simple frameworks uh, where I talk about drains and charges. And then when, a lot of what Jade and I are talking about today is, is human physiology. And you may not want to be able to, you know, write or speak to human physiology. You may not ever need to, but understanding that that we're, what we're talking about is basically the fact that uh, client practices or even your own practices, if we're talking about your fitness transformation, and then your perception uh, of yourself, uh, your, your relationships, your mindset, your ability to manage stress, your relationship with food, those two things combined, those practices, your daily habits, routines, rituals, the amount of sleep you get, the amount of food that you're eating, when we combine those basic daily practices, which as Jade said, they sound super simple, and then we combine your overall perception of this whole entire transformation process and what your body goes through on a day-to-day -day basis and just life in general as a whole, we ultimately have created this equation or ultimately um, formula for, for figuring out what's going on with your physiology. And before we can ever talk about a six pack or 10% body fat or running you know, a, a 5K or competing in CrossFit, having a physical goal, we have to understand the under, what's influencing that underlying physiology. And granted, there are, there are cases where an override switch may exist from like a prescription drug or people may have a physical trauma, um, whether that's a head injury, whether that's a gland injury or a reproductive function uh, issue that, that may be impacting their, their hormone levels. But 
at the root of all that at every single physical goal, we have to break down physiology into understanding what stressors are influencing the mindset and perception of this individual uh, and their journey to, through this fitness transformation. And then ultimately what practices are they implementing every single day from walking to, to their training stimulus to when they go to bed, the amount of sunlight that they're getting. They're all very basic things, but try to think of it in those categories. And I think it can be really helpful, especially for a client who's not going to understand what nutritional periodization is, or they're not going to understand uh, the deeper science of it all. You can basically just say, hey, I want you to work on your mindset or your perception here. Or, hey, this is these things that you do every day that you put in your calendar. Uh, I think practices are probably the easiest to understand because there, there are some prominent habit-based coaching companies out there. But just understanding that, that all of this deeper science really starts and originates with some of the most basic concepts, which is you know, getting sunlight, the right amount of food, and, and moving properly for our body type. Yeah, you know, it's funny you talk about nutritional periodization. I know not all of you may know what that is, and I'll bring Sam back at some point, hopefully, to talk about some of that stuff more in depth. But it really is. I love the, the whole charge, the whole charge thing, because here's what I have seen. I know you've seen it, too. I know people who are very overweight couch potatoes who are anxious, depressed, tired, sick, et cetera. I know people with six packs who have the exact same feeling anxious, depressed, tired, et cetera. And essentially what that is telling you is it's okay, fine. You might look good, but do you have high energy? Is it stable? And is it predictable? Is your iPhone, your metabolism balanced and charged and resilient? If it's not, that won't last. We know from actually the biggest loser study. Many of you know this. I like this because it speaks to just to what Sam's saying. They took those biggest losers who did this thing where they're like, let's make you look good and let's not pay any attention to the charge on your iPhone. Let's just beat the shit out of you for three months and force, you know, you to eat less and essentially put you in, you know, exercise concentration camp. Sure, they all looked much better. They all gained the weight back 80% and more. Some actually got fatter and they have metabolic changes that are negative changes that have lasted up to six years later because they did not adhere to this. So I think it's uh, super important. What I would love to do, man, is like, you know, I know you and I are going to potentially be doing a lot more stuff together. And, you know, Sam and I are talking about doing an event together with Cody and doing some other things, but I'd like to bring you back to talk about the more, the more in-depth stuff like, okay, nutritional periodization. I've talked about some of that. I just did a podcast. I think it was the last episode, maybe or two episodes ago on the Matador study, which sort of talks a little bit about, you know, changing up this, uh, you know, your nutrition to keep some of these negative reactions from happening. But we'll, we'll go into that. I think ultimately what I wanted Sam to do is come in. You hear it from me a lot, but you hear it one way. And he adds some very interesting nuances to it and his own take on it, which I think we need to hear. We need to hear other people sort of explain these things. And usually they add something we don't kind of know that goes, oh, that's why things aren't working for me. So I really want to you, Sam, to give your overarching sort of, um, you know, metabolic frameworks, which I think you did, and it was fantastic. But I'll let you, before we end, is there anything else you, you know, you think, uh, you know, you want to just cover briefly or uh, anything else you want to talk about? I think, I think that was a great, you know, starting point as far as metabolism goes. I'd love to, uh, um, you know, as, as Jade kind of mentioned, nutritional periodization, it sounds super complicated, but it's just like having a plan or a roadmap. Uh, obviously we could spend an entire episode talking about nutritional periodization, but whether you are, you know, in a contest preparation or you are a regular lifestyle client or just person trying to look and feel your best, you need to know, you need to have a plan for where you're going and a, a plan of how to get out of there. Once you get there, uh, just like you wouldn't necessarily drive across the country, you know, you, you probably have an idea of, of where you might want to go and what you're doing. Uh, we, we want a general roadmap and then an understanding of, okay, if this happens, uh, we need a plan to back out of it. And that's where reverse dieting or um, something like a matador protocol can be helpful to prevent negative adaptations. Because ultimately, if we bring our body to these places, it has these counterbalancing mechanisms to ultimately uh, make do with whatever the status quo is that we're sort of imposing on it. So I really like that, that Jade brought that up. Just the word periodization, big, big word, but really all it means with training and nutrition is just intelligently planning what you're doing, just like you'd plan out, you know, your workday in a calendar or 
or when you make plan social plans to go see your friends on a Friday or Saturday, you shoot them a text message, you're kind of periodizing what you're doing this weekend. So uh, don't let those terms kind of throw you off. But I love that Jade mentioned that. And then just the two different populations, I think you can be very unhealthy and be very lean. Same thing on the opposite side. When you are inactive, it's we've deviated from, it's because the, the practices there, the habits that went into creating that physiology were not sustainable. And ultimately the body is changing things like our, our serotonin levels or our neurotransmitter levels, uh, changing things like our insulin sensitivity as a response to everything that, that we're imposing on it. So whether that's being overactive and under eating for a period of time or being very, very sedentary, you know, for that sedentary overweight person, something as simple as walking is going to charge their iPhone. That's going to charge their body. It's going to improve insulin sensitivity. I think Jade, you were the one who taught me the, uh, the study on, uh, I think it was either in the Alps or somewhere like a Norwegian study where they just put folks in a little bit of a calorie deficit and had them walk for two weeks and it almost reversed type two diabetes. I think you told me about that. Um, and there were some other really cool, other really cool research as well. So by bringing people back to that sufficient charge, uh, regardless of what it is, and that's what makes a good coach is understanding what is draining the system and what is charging the system. So I really like that articulation of, of kind of what you were breaking down, but uh, yeah, I'd love to love to talk a little bit more about nutrition and periodization and definitely excited for what we're, we're trying to work out with Cody to potentially bring people some more live information and additional resources. Yeah, it's genius stuff, man. I mean, you're just, it's just, I'm excited to, to learn from you and just uh, so everyone knows me. So we're, you know, it's funny with internet business and the coaching model, we're all, you know, even my business has changed a little bit. I know your business is restructuring a little bit. Um, so um, tell everyone where they can find you. I, I typically tell people, you know, what, at JT on Instagram for me, because I got different businesses and right. different things. So it's better just to find me at, at JT. But how about for you? Because I know you're, you're going through some transitions as well. Instagram, Instagram at Sam Miller Science. Uh, so that's my full name. So Sam Miller. And then the word science, it's all one word. There's no spaces, no underscores, no periods, nothing like that. Um, and, and on that page, you can find resources. Uh, I have a hormonal blueprint ebook. If you're interested in hormones, uh, we do offer different varying lengths of programs as continuing education for coaches. If you're interested in, in sort of getting some additional exposure in these topics and you've previously either been overwhelmed or, or want to, to learn things outside of the basic certification of sets, reps, and calories, uh, there's, there's information on how you can apply that at Sam Miller Science on Instagram as well. Uh, our two main websites, so initially I was, you know, oraclefitness.com, which is Oracle Training and Nutrition for our programs, but uh, we're going to be moving a lot of that content over and creating a bit more of an article and blog site along with some videos for you guys at sammillerscience.com, uh, which will be a great place to find me as well. But for now, kind of like what Jade said, just because of the different ventures and stuff that I'm involved with, the uh, finding me on Instagram is a great starting point. I, I upload to stories and, and educate quite frequently on these topics. And then from there, you know, you can always reach out to me. I'm more than happy to link you with different resources, whether that's, whether that's a book, whether that's a, a course that you're interested in, uh, always here to answer questions and then hopefully more seminars and stuff uh, on the horizon here with Jade and Cody. Yeah, man, you know, it's funny. I, I was talking to a friend of mine. I said, oh, doesn't he do exactly what you do? And, I, you know, so they're like, people have this idea. They're like, doesn't Sam do exactly what you do? Doesn't Cody sort of do exactly what you do? And I was like, yeah, I mean, in a sense, we all do the same thing. But um, it's kind of like when you take three people and even if we had 10 people who are all sort of doing the same thing, we get to do compound learning. And so those of you who have just been following me and aren't following Sam, or aren't following Cody, or aren't following other professionals, you should because you're going to get other pieces brought in, you know, that you may not have gotten from JT. Just like if you're, you know, looking at Sam's stuff, you may get extra stuff from us. And you'll see a lot of overlap, which is great because then you get that uh, repeated sort of education. I, I, you know, it's funny because I, I think I didn't start following you until relatively recently. And I was just like, I got to start following more people like this because, you know, you just learn. But anyway, man, I think, I think you're a genius. I appreciate you being on here and sharing. And uh, I'm looking forward to doing more stuff with you as well. So until next time, my friend. All right, man. Take care. Thank you, brother.